Good afternoon and you are very welcome to uh, Tortoise COVID Inquiry or welcome back if you were here this morning. My name is Kerry Thomas, I'm one of the editors at Tortoise and it's um, a delight to have you all with us again for the uh, the after lunch session that we will try to make sure it's not a sleepy after lunch session. Um, uh, for the next hour um, we're going to be looking at the experience of care homes in the pandemic and the question we've set ourselves is how did we fail our most frail? And we can ask that question knowing that we can measure what we find against a, uh, a clear statement of intent from the UK government. In fact, not just as it were a statement of prospective intent, um, but a statement of commitment from the very beginning of the pandemic. Right from the start, said Matt Hancock in May, we've tried to throw a protective ring around our care homes. Now you can say many things about that statement, but you can't say if that was the government's intention uh, right from the start, that it, it has succeeded. Around a third of all the coronavirus deaths uh, in the UK have been in care homes, and maybe, maybe many more than that. I think it's worth acknowledging up front that the care system is not the NHS. It's not monolithic, it's fragmented, it is highly devolved, and it's provided by a mix of public and private and voluntary organisations. The best estimate I've seen is that there may be as many as 37,000 different providers of care across the UK. So not an easy thing to monitor or corral, but still, still, how have our governments done in throwing a protective ring around it in this pandemic? So here's how this session is going to work. Um, my great colleague Phoebe Davis is your chat host and uh, she's really important here because we've got a panel of experts who I will introduce in just a moment. <clears throat> um, but we also want to, uh, to, to draw witnesses into the conversation as well. And the way to put yourself forward as a witness is through Phoebe in the chat. So if you've got experience uh, of social care as a professional, if you've got personal experience, if you've got policy or academic experience, then, then talk to Phoebe in the chat and we will move people from the chat into the, into the conversation on air. Um, but let me just get straight into it and introduce the people who we've um, got to help us uh, wrap our heads around this, this subject. We've got Natasha Curry, who's a senior fellow in health policy at the Nuffield Trust. We've got Eileen Chubb, who is the founder and director of Compassion in Care. We've got Ian Birrell, who's a writer and journalist. Uh, Care Systems, one of his specialist topics, and a lot of you will have seen Ian writing brilliantly about that for Tortoise. We've got Tom Redfern, who's the Public Affairs Manager at the Alzheimer's Society. And last but by no means least, we've got Professor Lydia Hayes, who's head of the Law School at the University of Kent. And actually, I think the author of a major study uh, report into social care for the Wellcome Trust not that long ago. And Lydia, if you are there, I can't see you on my screen. Um, what I'd like to do, if we can, um, there you are. Um, we've asked you, Lydia, to, to help us uh, understand this by setting out the um, what you see as the uh, the experience of the social care system through the pandemic in the next few minutes. So if I can hand over to you to do that, that will get us off to a flying start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Lovely, thank you. In times long before COVID, but not so long ago, a report was tabled at the United Nations Human Rights Council meeting of 2019. Written by Professor Philip Alston, it summarised his findings of a formal visit to the UK to investigate the impact of government policies and programmes on extreme poverty and consistency with its human rights obligations. He found social care services to be at breaking point. He said that policies pursued since 2010 amount to retrogressive measures in clear violation of the country's human rights obligations. This indicates the extent to which care provision is both a political and a legal issue. Cuts in public spending in the name of austerity that were targeted at local authorities since 2010 produced an £86 million reduction in the funding of adult social care, according to Age UK, at the same time as demand was increasing rapidly. Before the coronavirus crisis, it was widely known for years 
that care services were in crisis. And that crisis had engulfed all aspects of this diverse sector. It's not all state funded. And the number of individual and families who pay privately has risen rapidly. At two million strong, the size of the workforce is considerably larger than the NHS. And when the pandemic hit the UK, there were 122,000 vacancies for hands-on care workers. The sector had grown rather accustomed to its hand-to-mouth existence. The legal framework that created rights and duties and shaped service delivery had been regularly reviewed and subject to amendment as a consequence of public scandals, such as the unnecessary deaths of older patients at Midstaff's hospital, which prompted the Francis inquiry, and the Winterbourne View scandal, in which people with intellectual disabilities were abused and neglected by those who were responsible for their care. In England, An amendment to the regulatory framework in 2015 put reducing harm at the heart of social care regulation. The power vested in the Secretary of State that gave him the option to impose regulatory requirements on providers of care became a duty on the Secretary of State to impose requirements to secure care services that cause no avoidable harm to the persons for whom services are provided. And this raises important questions about what happened in care. Were the deaths in care homes of thousands of people from COVID-19 a consequence of harm that was avoidable? Was the risk of infection and transmission one that could not have been reasonably avoided? Our speakers today will provide evidence that calls into question whether care homes were overwhelmed by a force of nature or whether more could and should have been done to ensure obvious harms were avoided. The regulations to which all registered care providers in England are subject set out standards below which care must not fall. These regulations demand that care must be provided in a safe way and that registered providers must do all that is reasonably practical to mitigate any risks to the health and safety of service users. A breach of this aspect of the regulations is a criminal offence if it results in service users being exposed to avoidable harm or significant risk of harm. Were the deaths in care homes the result of exposure to a significant risk of harm? Our speakers will draw attention to the actors who might be held accountable for this exposure and to the decisions taken that exposed people to risk rather than upheld their legal rights to safe care. The organisation responsible for compliance and enforcement of regulations in England is the Care Quality Commission. In the early stages of the pandemic in March, the Care Quality Commission announced its suspension of its routine inspection of services. The regulatory bodies in Wales and Scotland followed suit. Interestingly, each cited the prioritisation of safe care as the core reason for suspending inspections. The argument was that visitors would transmit virus and that the goal of safe care required care providers to focus on the needs of service users and residents rather than to worry unduly about demonstrating compliance. However, at a time when lockdown rules prevented friends and family from visiting care homes, it is reasonable to question whether an absence of oversight by care standards inspectors Mm. contributed to the deprioritisation of adherence to legal rules designed to ensure safe care. It's certainly the case that we know less than we would otherwise about what happened in care homes during the crucial period of late February through to June. For the time when COVID began to ravage through care homes, society's key eyewitnesses are care workers and care home residents. However, both 
are groups that are socially marginalised. They are rarely, if ever, included in policy development. They find it hard to be listened to at the best of times. They face multiple disadvantages and are those who are still processing the traumas that the pandemic inflicted on them. This tortoise inquiry panel, What Happened in Care, contributes important evidence to fill a considerable knowledge gap. Over 19,000 care home residents died from COVID-19, according to the ONS, between the 2nd of March and the 12th of June. Over 38,000 excess deaths occurred in the same period, which will have included those with undiagnosed COVID-19. The deaths of Black and Asian care home residents was disproportionately high. The discharge of people from hospitals to care homes without testing has been identified as a key problem in transmission. My research team at Kent Law School found that an overwhelming majority of care workers reported the absence of occupational sick pay as a key reason why they were unable to self-isolate. Department of Health guidance on the use of personal protective equipment by care workers was inadequate to protect residents and workers during February, March and April. The unavailability of PPE was a chronic problem across the sector. The crisis in care that had pre-existed and preceded the pandemic, to what extent might that have provided the conditions for a perfect storm in which an unimaginable tragedy took hold. In conclusion, I welcome the expertise and contribution of this panel to shed light on ways in which what happened in care, this terrible tragedy, speaks to the undervaluing of care, the undervaluing of the care workforce, and the undervaluing of the human rights and human dignity of people who need care and support. Thank you. No, thank you, Lydia. That was absolutely fantastic. Was, that was very fair, very thoughtful. I think it gives us some big pointers as to where we should uh, where we should go in this conversation. Let me let me come back to you, Lydia, on just a couple of points. You you, you opened really with um, by painting a picture of a care system that has been underfunded and was in a sort of weakened state um, going into the pandemic. How, in your mind, how significant a factor is that in the um, in, in where it's ended up? You are muted. I don't know why. Um, that was a bit okay, <laughs> I can now turn myself back on. I, the evidence that's been collected by my team suggests that the issues are fundamentally connected. Issues to way, the way in which the care sector is organised, the difficulties that the government appears to have had in pulling levers which would have been necessary for a prompter and more coordinated uh, response across the sector. They are linked to the organisation of the sector, the way in which you have already pointed to the massive fragmentation of that sector, to the way in which the sector has been undervalued, the way in which those who use care services, their rights and their interests haven't been at the fore. And this quite corrosive narrative, I think that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic about somehow it was okay or not as awful if the people who died were towards the end of their lives or were people who had underlying health conditions that I think that what happened in care homes speaks to very strongly to a lot of the issues of inequality that have been uh, brought to the fore by COVID, both in relation to those who need care and support services and also critically to those who work in them and the way in which their contribution is not valued. Okay, um, and Lydia, just finally, before I bring in the rest of the panel, um, you raised this really important question about whether the harm was avoidable, and that's really the core of what we're here to talk about. There is a, I think there's a different way of thinking about that, which was actually was the harm in care homes um, inflicted in a, deliberately 
in order to minimize harm in hospitals. If you think of that early period when there's a, when there are people being discharged from hospitals um, without tests and sent to care homes, does it seem possible to you that, that actually it's worse than it's worse than whether the harm was avoidable, that actually it was a calculation that was made in full knowledge of what the outcome was likely to be? I don't have uh, any evidence personally to, to be able to say that that decision was deliberate. Uh, however, it was very evident from the beginning of the government's response to the pandemic that the government had very little understanding of what actually happened in care homes, what the function of care homes were. So for example, we had this differentiation between outbreaks in care homes and outbreaks in the community, as though care homes were not part of the community. The inaccuracy, the chronic inaccuracy in Department of Health advice around PPE demonstrated that there was very little understanding of what care workers actually did. So yes, certainly the prioritization of the health service had a knock-on effect on what happened in care homes. I couldn't say that that was a deliberate decision. I think it was rather a consequence of the fact that too few people are listened to and that the interests of workers, those in the sector and those that use the sector have been routinely ignored. And so there is a legacy of enormous ignorance about social care. OK, um, Lydia, thank you so much. We will come back to you shortly. Let me for a moment, though, turn to Natasha Curry, who's from the Nuffield Trust Senior Fellow in Health Policy there. Um, Natasha, can I just, um, Lydia's given us some numbers. Um, the ONS numbers, are, I think, uh, will be updated before long. But what's 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 our best estimate of what the excess deaths have been in UK? I think we've got to be careful to distinguish between UK, England, and the development. What, what's the best estimate of the of the uh, excess deaths we've had in care homes uh, in the UK? Um, well, obviously, the, the numbers are constantly being updated, and I think your estimate of a, a third of all, all COVID deaths happening in care homes is probably best that we have at the moment um, obviously that will keep changing and it depends obviously how you measure that if it's covid direct, you know covid positive test or if it's covid suspected um, so i but i think it's safe to say that a, a significant proportion of all covid deaths have occurred in the care home setting i think where we have less understanding is how many covid deaths in homes have been amongst people who have been recipients of social care, home, you know, home care in, in private homes. And that's a big piece of, of, of missing information that we don't have at the moment. OK, and because I think we're going to struggle in the 42 minutes we've got left to cover everything, um, which, which do you think are the most important aspects of this discussion that we should focus on? We could look at the decisions to discharge from hospitals, we could look at testing, we could look at PPE, we could look at the, uh, the state in which care homes went into this crisis. Where, 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 where do you think the most um, important areas are likely to be? Well, I think, I think it's helpful to maybe think about the, the, um, what's happened in, from two perspectives. So, a, the response and, and what went wrong, what was inadequate, and um, what could we, what could we and should we have done better? Uh, what could we reasonably have been expected to do better? And then the second sort of area of evidence is what was the state of the sector going into the into the crisis that we that we could have addressed in in the past. So. I think there's those two aspects. Obviously, those are two massive <laughs> sort of areas to cover, and you're right that uh, it's difficult to narrow down. But I think if we're if we're really honing in on on the response, I think I would have three main criticisms of it. I think it was too slow. I think when we look back, the social care action plan came nearly a full month after the announcement that we were going into a national lockdown and by the time that came obviously the impacts were already being felt across across the sector and in that time the the sector was um, given changing misleading guidance one of the examples there about PPE I think in one of the pieces of guidance care staff were asked were told they didn't need PPE but they should deliver care at a distance showing you know a, a fundamental misunderstanding about what, what happens in the care sector I think um, the the 
social care was largely invisible in those early weeks. Uh, we had a very NHS focused response. And when we're thinking about the, the discharge policy, I don't think that the policy itself is, is wrong. You know, it was right to, to, to clear hospitals given what we, we were facing. But I think there was just too little consideration about the state of the sector into which people were, many of those people were being discharged um, and a sort of lack of joined up thinking and integration about how, how the response needed to come together. I think it's interesting when we look at the SAGE minutes, that the, the mentions of um, social care care homes is really minimal. I think it's twice, two mentions um, in, in January to March, which I think shows how, um, how invisible the, the, the sector really is. And then I think, thirdly, as, as Lydia has, has mentioned, I think there's just a, a real lack of understanding or lack of recognition in the response about the complexity of this sector. It's not just care homes. It's, you know, the majority of care is delivered in the community, in people's private homes. It's not just older people. There are a huge number of people, working age adults, people with learning disabilities, et cetera, who, who rely on, on care. And the, the diversity of provision with you know, more than 20,000 providers um, just shows that it's a, a hugely complex system. And those providers are you know, range from big national chains to very small one site family run homes or agencies and I don't think that the response has really been uh, uh, sensitive to that sort of complexity. I'll tell you what that, that's what you said about say two mentions between January and March of a sector in which a third of all Covid fatalities may well have happened that does seem astonishing to be quite a useful indicator of the, the centrality of this sector to to the way the government and, and even the non-governmental non body like say just thought about it. Um, on that note, let me bring in Ian Birrell. Um, Ian, great to have you here. Um, you have been reporting on the care sector for a long time. I don't know how many years you've been at it, but um, given what you know and the people you've talked to and what, what, you, what your impression is of attitudes in central government to, to the care sector, when you hear Matt Hancock say, we, our intention from the start was to throw a protective ring around the sector. How, how likely does that seem to be true, given, given the reporting you've done over the years? To be honest, I find it quite repulsive when he says that this is a man who went into the crisis where there was still, and he was doing nothing about the fact that thousands of people mm. under his care at NHS expense who are locked up in psychiatric units because of the dearth of community provision. We've known that for years, nothing has been done. It's more expensive and it leads to less good outcomes. And I think what we're really seeing here with this, we can focus really on why was it in mid-March that, that the government was still saying that there's no, there's no risk of, care, of um, coronavirus causing havoc in care homes and in the community settings. The question is why? And I think that it's, it's very easy to get ground down and you know, why was PPE so slow to be delivery? Behind it, I think are very deep, profound questions for us, for us all as to why is it that the government so prioritized the health service, partly political because it's their Achilles heel and they're terrified of ever being seen as being doing anything wrong with the health service. So all the emphasis was on that. But then also, so why is it that we entered this crisis with the social care system in such disarray, so corroded. What does it say about our society that even now we don't we ignore the fact that as as we've just heard, a quarter of people in uh, care homes are of, of working age. There was a report last week by Public Health England showing that. Um, the rate of deaths from the virus in the early stages among people with learning disabilities was six times higher than any other group in society. Now we've had right, rightly a lot of focus on black and ethnic minority people who have died from this. Absolutely zero, again, on people with learning disabilities and autism. Why is that? These questions are all linked, I think, as to why we entered, because there's very little attention given to elderly people there's very little attention given to people learning disabilities and autism and we hear again and again that this is a problem about austerity about struggling providers about badly paid staff uh, all of which is true austerity has exacerbated the problems but the problems go far deeper and actually it's not always about the lack of money it's also about more profound uh, profound issues about the fact that we have a system which relies often in the most extreme levels, like with the psychiatric system on incarceration rather than community setting. We've stripped away in both mental health services and social care, a lot of the 
community um, facilities which allow people to be to live a better life and to be supported in a in a more friendly warm atmosphere where they can remain within their community but behind it all i think a lot of the problem is that we've seen a development towards bigger care homes if you have a bigger care home that means that if you get a virus you're going to have more deaths in it that's just logic's basic fact we've seen that abroad we've now seen that here why do we have this drive towards bigger care homes the reason is because we've had uh uh, shark like private equity companies, hedge funds, etc., see this as a way they can create, make a lot of money. They saw it as a property play, and they also saw it as the place where, with uh, rising demand, they could cream off profits. They're very short term, it's all debt funded, um, and it's not about delivering good care. And you look at the big providers who have increased their, their uh, size of homes and increased their share of the market. These are companies with very opaque co corporate structures, which in some are, are creamy off, although they're often loss making on the surface. You delve into all those Cayman Island companies and Channel Island companies, et cetera, and you'll see all these payments going from one company to another owned by the same people. You'll see people making a lot of money and uh, you'll see people paying themselves a lot of money uh, while paying the frontline staff delivering the service and heroically risking their lives in this, in this crisis. Uh, peanuts, and the, uh, they're making a lot of money off the back of it. So what we've had is we've allowed the sector to corrode. We've allowed these sharks to come in and to rip it off and to take off huge amounts of profit and money pr secretly uh, and opaquely and hidden from, from taxpayers and, and government. And no one's really cared. And why has no one cared about it? Why has the situation been allowed to happen? Because at the end of the day, our society does not really recognize the importance and the value of people who need social care, which are people with learning disabilities, people with autism and older people and people with um, comorbidities, quite severe health issues. And I think that's really the fundamental question which lies underneath that. That's why we went into this crisis with such a, a social care system in such a bad state, why we allowed these operators to come in and rip it off, why we allowed the frontline staff to be paid so little. And even now, even throughout the crisis, it was, de it was deprioritized from the very start. And people in um, receiving domiciliary care, which is the bigger numbers, uh, got such bad uh, uh, advice, if any. And even now, most or many of them are in absolute terrible state, getting no support, no help, and their voices are completely silent. And so Thank I would you, because a very deep crisis for us all. My, my colleague Tessa has put into the chat the piece that you wrote, which looked at the ownership and the and the, and the um, very often offshore ownership of some of the big care home chains. So so do look at that if you get a chance. I, I read a report yesterday that had come from the University of Manchester, who who did a survey of th data from thirteen thousand English, English care homes in the course of the crisis. What they found was that they they couldn't find I think any difference in death rates between differently owned homes. So public or private, it didn't seem to make a difference to the to the outcomes in individual homes. But is your point that actually ownership structures had, had, had influenced the whole system long before this crisis landed? We know, we, studies have shown that the um, size of care home, the number of operators mm -hmm. had, had come down slightly and the size of homes had gone up because these are people who are looking to maximize their profits. They're not the traditional family who have been running a care home in their community. They're big operators who are looking to maximize profits. So they, they want to make bigger places, which in my view are often much less homely. We call them care homes, but if they're huge sort of corporatized places, they're not very homely. Um, and uh, if you have a place with, instead of five people, 60 or 70, obviously if the virus comes in, it's going to have a wider effect just because there's more people gathered there. So that's the point I'm making about the size of care homes being important. I think it's dehumanizing because they're not homes anymore if they're that big. Um, they're sort of industrialized places. And equally, it's, it's, they're more lethal when you do get a virus. And we've seen that from studies in other parts of the world as well. Okay, Ian, Ian, just before I go on to Tom, I, I raised this with Lydia. <clears throat> so, so Lydia quite rightly said, um, the real question we're dealing with is, was the harm avoidable? And when I put it to her that maybe it was worse than that, actually there was a, there was a decision taken to uh, 
to, to shift the harm from hospitals to care homes through that period, particularly up to the middle of April when um, people were being discharged without any kind of testing at all. Um, she, Lydia quite rightly said she didn't have the evidence to support that idea. Have you come across any evidence that um, people knew what they were doing when they were moving people out of hospitals and into care homes? That there was some sort of modelling that suggested what the outcomes would be at that um, when that happened? Uh, I don't have hard evidence. I don't think either that uh, I don't believe politicians want to kill people and I don't think it was intentional. We should also recognise that Britain isn't the only place which had this issue. We saw it in Sweden, in Spain, in Belgium, in Canada, lots of other places as well have had similar issues, in some cases a higher death rate within care home settings. So it's not a uniquely British problem. However, it is I think very clear that from the very start you could see all the emphasis was on the health service and protecting people within the health service and there was very little help given to people in any form of, of social care setting, whether it's domiciliary or residential. And I think that was, uh, put it this way, I'd love to ask Boris Johnson whether he believes corporate manslaughter should apply in the public sector. Okay, that's a very good question. Um, Tom Redfern, are you there from the Alzheimer's Society? Uh, yes, there you are, I think. Um, Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Can I, can I just, um, ask what, what your experience has been at the Alzheimer's Society in a sort of broad sense, uh, how, whether you have felt that that statement from Matt Hancock of, uh, that, that a protective ring had been thrown around the sector from the start, whether that's felt true at any point now or throughout the duration of this? Um, I'm not really sure what he means by that. Um, I haven't seen a huge amount of evidence or much evidence at all around that. Um, and I guess it, it, it's probably worth just giving you a bit of context as to as to why Alzheimer's Society are, are so kind of involved and, and interested in this area. So you, roughly, and I, I don't want to overload you with, with statistics, but I just think it's worth giving a, a bit of context. So there are around about 850,000 people in the UK with some form of dementia. About 39% of those will live in residential um, care, such as care homes, with the remaining 61% in the community. and as Ian pointed out, many of those will have received domiciliary care or also informal care from, from loved ones. Um, at least 70% of care home residents have some form of dementia and some numbers uh, indicate that it is actually closer to 86%. So anything that happens in care homes will disproportionately affect people with dementia. And of the COVID deaths, at least 14,000 of those were among people with dementia. So if you think back to where we were at the beginning uh, of the pandemic, the, the government wrote to one and a half million people who had various respiratory conditions, certain cancers, immunodeficiency diseases, and a range of other conditions, um, and instructed them to, or recommended that they, they shield. At that time, the dementia was not considered to make you clinically vulnerable to COVID. Uh, and so those living with the condition were not told, told to shield either at the time or since, it, it still isn't the case. And yet at this point, 27.5% of all COVID deaths in the UK have been amongst people with dementia. And it is the most prominent underlying condition. And I would say that contrary to, to some of the rhetoric around this, these weren't people who were going to die soon anyway. That's just not true. Many of those people would have had years of fulfilling life ahead of them. Um, and also as well, it's worth noting that separate to those COVID deaths involving people with dementia, those dying just of dementia were 52% higher than normal during this time. And there's a, there's a myriad of reasons as to why that might be the case. I, I've no doubt that many of those will have been people with undiagnosed COVID, but also one of the um, particular attributes of dementia is that if you don't keep your communication and your cognitive skills sharp, you will lose them and you will lose them for good and you will deteriorate more rapidly and you will die prematurely. And that has been one of the, um, the things that we have been trying to put forward around the importance of care home visits, because if that doesn't happen, then people will deteriorate and we are now into the eighth month when many of those care home residents wouldn't have had any visits from, from loved ones. 
And that's particularly tragic when you consider that the, the average um, tenure in a care home is about two years before, before that resident dies. Um, but I think generally in terms of social care, my view is that there is a, an, an ignorance. I, I'm not necessarily saying it's a willful ignorance, but an ignorance in um, central government, both from officials and politicians, as to what social care is. Um, so right at the beginning of the pand pandemic, we saw a lot of uh, hospitals being essentially emptied into care homes. Uh, there was no testing of anybody going uh, from a hospital into a care home. It's undoubtable uh, that, that many of those were taking the virus with them. Um, as Natasha mentioned, there wasn't a social care action plan until mid-April, by which point the vast majority of those who, who would have died, uh, who've died in care homes mm -hmm. as a result of had already died by that point. Um, and the, I think also as well, there is an ignorance within the NHS as to the clinic, clinical skills of care homes and care home staff. With care homes do not by and large have clinical staff in the, the building. There are nursing homes that are staffed by nurses, but those are very much in the minority. The vast majority of care, home, uh, care homes are staffed by people on minimum wage with minimal training um, and often uh, very, very high turnover rates. So they will have very little um, uh, relationship with the people that they, they care for. Sorry, Kerry. No, that's I, you're about. I just want to pick up on some things you said, because it seems to me that that question of visits, um, which is intimately connected to the question of testing, is one that we should touch on as well. So can you just tell us what, what the situation is as regards testing uh, now, uh, Matt Hancock was making some what looked like fairly rash promises about uh, testing that would be achieved by Christmas, even this week. Um, what, what's your understanding of, of the availability of tests at the moment? So at the moment, there is a trial going on in um, Cornwall, I think it's Dorset, Dorset or Devon and Hampshire um, to enable um, certain loved ones to be classified as a key worker, which would mean that they have access to regular testing, which would en enable them to, to go into care homes and provide uh, that vital care that they provide. That is obviously a very small number of people and we are eight months in and it's too little too late, to be honest. Um, the, it's also just been announced in the last hour uh, that um, uh, domiciliary care staff will be tested regularly. And you know, we are eight months in to this pandemic and, and that is far too late. Um, there was talk of um, care home staff being tested weekly and care home residents being tested uh, all weekly. And that was due to come in before the summer. It didn't actually come in until the beginning of September. Um, but we think we at Alzheimer's Society believe that with that, uh, by enabling a one or two named individuals in that um, care home resident's life, allocate them as a key worker, enable them to have regular testing, enable them to have access to PPE and uh, provide them with some kind of infection control training. That's probably too strong of a term. Um, and we are, we are already doing that for care home staff, um, but we need to do that for care home, uh, for the loved ones of care residents as well. Because once you, when we took out those loved ones, we essentially at least halved the care that care home residents were receiving. Many uh, loved ones go into care homes for several hours a day and provide intensive care to their loved ones. And removing that, you are removing a huge amount of care. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like, if I can, to, to bring in Catherine Preston as a witness. Phoebe, can we, can we find Catherine? Because um, Catherine, you've been making some points in the chat about, I think your mother has been in care uh, for nearly two years now. What's, um, are you there, Catherine? Yes, I think I've unmuted now. Is that right? You're there. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, hello, hello. Thank you. I've been here most of the time since eight o'clock this morning. So thank you, everybody. It's been fascinating. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, I, I was very pleased. Am I okay to carry on? Please do, yeah. Yes, okay. I wasn't sure if you could hear me. Um, yes, uh, I was very pleased to be able to um, listen to all of this. Uh, I, I watch 
the news and pick up everything I can to try and get some a handle on what's going on. Uh, very briefly, I used to be um, um, a councillor in Bury, and I was a cabinet member for adult health and social care. Uh, um, and my mother at the time was very poorly. So I managed to get a lot. I didn't pull rank, I promise. But I did manage to learn a lot about the care system. Um, and when mum went into care, she was in hospital a couple of times. So my point, I, I will try to move on, uh, is about hospital discharge. Before COVID, uh, I have, my mother, and I've seen it happen to lots of other older people in hospital, were very often rushed out. And you turn into a bit of a rockweiler. I'm, some, I'm sure some of you will, will perhaps understand what I mean, in the sense that you know your own um, mother, father, relative, and you know if they're well or not. And there was this always this rush, always this argument almost for, for to get uh, the person out. And at one point I was told that mum was fit to leave, but she actually didn't have anywhere to live. She was actually homeless because the care home wouldn't take her back because her needs had changed. So that's one aspect of hospital discharge. My point is that the discharge of older people into care homes has always been a problematic area. And obviously this was exacerbated uh, once we got into this awful situation with, with the COVID virus. That's my first point. The second point is about communication. I think a lot of people like me who have relatives in a care home have suffered because the communication, as you've just pointed out from the um, news and government statements has either been vague, too slow, unclear. And similarly, the care homes themselves have been, you know, so risk averse and so worried. I'm fortunate mum lives in a care home that fortunately hasn't been touched by COVID yet. But I do live in Berwick upon Tweed uh, <laughs> and it is a very small family run care home. So from that point of view, I I'm absolutely, totally grateful to my um, the people look after my mum. But the whole point is the business of com communication to relatives from the government, from everybody really, has just left you in this hopeless huddle. And all you do, or well, all I manage to do is wave through a window and I just have to keep quiet. And as you can tell, I'm probably not very good at keeping quiet. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to add that in and say, we wanted and we still want proper information, which is why I have sat through all of this today, because I want to know what's going on. And I fear that a lot of us in whatever situation we're in are actually not getting the right information. So I will just leave that with you. Thank you for listening. Catherine, I would listen some more. Um, Catherine, how has it been just being able to wave at your mum through a window for the last eight months? Now, you sound a bit like a Sky News reporter there. You know how it's been. <laughs> It is. It, it, I, I don't need to go into it. We can all tell everybody how miserable we've been and how we continue to be and all the rest of it. So you, I'll leave you to imagine that. All right. OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for that, but you know what I'm talking about. How does it make you feel? Crap. OK. <laughs> OK, um, I, I want to bring Andrew McKeon in as a witness as well, if Andrew's there. Um, Andrew, because you, I think, you used to work in the Department of Health, is that right? Uh, that's correct, yes. And, and so tell me, um, what was your experience of the attitudes towards social care sector while you were there? Well, I think as I said in my chat note, uh, I would say it was largely, it was a low priority area in which certainly the most senior people in the department took very little interest and knowledge, uh, had very little knowledge of really. Uh, and that was obviously partly a reflection of Minister's own priorities, um, which were inevitably focused on the NHS. And within that probably hospitals one, GPs two, and others a rather poor third, uh, or even lower. So it's not really, and I don't think things have probably changed very much uh, since then in terms of the knowledge, experience, and level of priority given to social care. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Natasha, can I just come back to you on this point? Because you, you, you touched on it earlier on, um, which was that, I'm just trying to figure out how much, it, how, big a, 
how big a factor in this it is the sector is so poorly understood uh, in government, as Andrew was just saying. Um, how, how important do you think that is in where we've ended up? I think it's a really, really crucial factor in where we've ended up in, in two ways. So I think it, it speaks to the long-standing failure to reform the system, despite 20 years of proposals and reviews and inquiries, but no uh, sub substantial change, because I think there's just a lack of, of impetus do that at, at a political level, at a sort of central government level. As Andy was saying, it's just not not been a priority. Um, and I think it, this really this really became a problem in, in the response because I think what we saw in those in those early months was just a lack of understanding of how the system works. And I've had many conversations with providers who were astonished at the sort of questions they were being asked by people at the Department of Health, which really revealed that there's not that in-depth expertise at the scale that was needed to manage a response in this, in this sector. And I think what, what's really been revealed in, in this is that Whitehall really has very few levers to pull to make things happen in this, in this system. It's a very fragmented and complex um, system delivered across thousands of different providers. And there's no clear accountability, which I think became a real problem. In contrast to you know, the NHS uh, experience where there is clear accountability um, and that command and control sort of uh, uh, structure, which I think helped in coordinating the response. Social health had none of that. Um, and I think we found that there are actually very few established communication channels between government and, and providers um, and few channels for getting the extra funding and supplies to the to the front line. And that's really that was really compounded by a lack of data about the sector. There's no reliable national minimum data set in this in this area. We know we from the CQC, we know a list of providers who are registered with them, but that's not the full scale of provision. Um, we have very little knowledge about the self-funders because we need to understand, you know, that the publicly funded um, part of the market is just part of a, a slim part of, of the system. We've got a huge number of people who are self-funding that we know very, very little about. So I think I think that lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, lack of data was a really important factor in explaining how the impacts that we've seen. And it may not be that easy to resolve, I suppose, because on the one hand, you know, we just heard from Ian Birrell saying that the, um, the, the, the sort of the entry into the market of big providers can create its own set of problems, larger homes, uh, more transmission of the disease in larger homes, which we can see in the data. Um, but is it inevitable that if we're going to avoid this happening again, the sector has to change in some quite fundamental way, whether that's through, you know, uh, some sort of pulling together of the of the provi providers, or or taking the whole sector under the the wing of the health service in some way. What, what, what do you think the policy answers might be? Well, I think that I think as has been made at the point has been made by many people before me that a fundamental reform to this system is long overdue. Um, we've known about the, the the pressures in the system, the inadequacies of it for twenty years. I mean the 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 um, Royal Commission on Long-Term Care was published in 1999, setting out the problem. So we've known them for a long time, uh, but we've failed to act on them. I mean, the solutions are many and varied. And, and we, we, I think one of the, the stumbling blocks in how we've approached this in this country is that we always talk about the funding first, and it's all about how do we pay for care and who's going to pay. But we need to be thinking about actually reform to the whole system. So as you say, it's not just about the money, it's about how care is provided and how we manage the provider market. So I think we need a, a strong vision for the sort of um, system that we want to create. And then we need to put in place the structures and mechanisms to do that. Um, on your point, of should the social care come under, system come under the NHS, I'd be very cautious about that um, That. Um, approach uh, for a number of reasons but I think there are a number of proposals that have been you know, uh, put out there about potential solutions but it doesn't we do need a fundamental reform of the entire system. Ian Birrell if I can just come back to you for a second because um, obviously you're you know you, you you talk to people in government in Whitehall um, about this do you do you get any sense and you have been for a long time do you get any sense that there is now an appetite finally to, to grasp this nettle? 
uh, I think there is an acknowledgement that it's risen up the political agenda and something needs to be done. There's also been um, uh, the campaign by papers such as the Daily Mail pushing at certain aspects of this issue. I have a fear that what we're going to see is a concentration on uh, pe people who uh, are paying their own way for care for elderly people and for self-payers, which is an important part of the equation but it ignores the fact that a lot of the worst care is going to people who are funded by councils because council budgets have been so so uh, so crushed. And it also ignores the, the big rise in demand that's coming from working age adults and from people with learning disabilities and such like. So yes, I think there is impetus to do something, but my fear is it'll be a very piecemeal and partial um, and I totally agree with the previous speaker that what we actually need to do is sit back and really think, what do we want with our care system? It's not as simple as a lot of the answers that are being put forward. It's not just about training of staff. Obviously, pay of staff is important and status of staff is vital, but it's not as simple as saying if they were better trained. I don't think uh, compassion and care is necessarily about training. It's about the sort of person who does the work and about the sort of society we have. So I think we need to sit back and really ask what sort of social care do we want? Not have these simplistic answers like, you know, put it into one system with the NHS, not to have simplistic answers. It's not all of it. Some private providers are terrific. It's not all the private is bad and some NHS stuff is terrible. So it's not all state is good. So you can't have simplistic um, answers to this. There's a lot of very shallow discussion, I'm afraid I think on it, which is very dislocated from reality on the ground. But I think we have to sit back and just sit back and think what sort of care do we want in a modern, supposedly civilised society? Because at the moment, we're failing a lot of people. And it's a real shock to people. I mean, to me, it was with my own family. My father had dementia for many years before dying earlier this year. My daughter has been in the social care system now for uh, two decades. And uh, it's one of the worst experiences of my life was uh, trying to access that care. And as any parent of a disabled child will tell you, it's an absolute nightmare trying to get things that other people take for granted, which totally, totally crushes you. So we need to just sort out to have a, a decent social care system rather than just go for patsy answers, <clears throat> which may satisfy whether it's the vested interest of the big private operators who dominate a lot of the debate, uh, whether it's the, the uh, wealthier people when care provision has been sliding away from disadvantaged areas of the country. These are the sort of issues we need to fundamentally resolve, which is, and really it's about what sort of country do we want to be? Okay. <clears throat> um, Ian mentioned their compassion care, and he's reminded me, I'm sorry, Eileen Chubb, I've, I've, I've asked far too much patience of you keeping me there and um, not coming to you, so forgive me. Um, Eileen set up and now runs Compassion in Care. Eileen, if I can go, if I can go back to the beginning, really, and, and where Lydia pointed us, that question of which of the harms that have been done were avoidable? What, what to you seems to have been most avoidable in, in what you've seen? Um, I've got to say that I think that it was all avoidable. 80% um, of the whistleblowers who contacted our helpline raising valid concerns have not surprisingly all lost their jobs as a direct result. Many of them are traumatised and won't go back into care as a result. So every month anyway, regardless COVID, we're, we're losing caring staff. That's the reality. Um, early on, the, um, the staff content, contact in our helpline, 60% increase, were raising valid concerns about people with COVID being admitted to the home because people with dementia are in most care homes and they wander in and out of people's rooms and straight away you could see how that virus could spread. Um, the government guidance um, might have worked in a hospital setting, but it was clear from day one that it would never work in a care home, but the government didn't want to learn from that. And when we, we published 14 COVID reports based on data from our helpline, the voices from the front line, and those voices are heartbreaking. Um, I do agree with Ian, uh, there's an awful lot of money in the care sector and an awful lot of people have got rich and there can be no excusing of, of the millions, billions that have been made up to this point. 
what we saw with COVID was basically the result of profit in care and, and profit at any price. I myself am a whistleblower, so um, I come from the front line. I know what it is to work in a care home. And the first thing you see when you're putting people in, into a care home with COVID is the foreseeable deaths that will occur. And we were also hearing from uh, Spanish care workers and Italian care workers. Um, and all of those lessons were could easily have been learned. The second thing is we had to do an FOI to the CQC to obtain data that showed up to June, 6,000 deaths in residential care homes. People, many more died because they couldn't have a drip. They couldn't have dehydration um, because they couldn't swallow. Um, care staff were telling us about people that were gasping for breath with their mouths cracked because they couldn't get a drink and there was no nurses to administer a drip. Um, that was, I saw a war zone every day during, between March and July. What we saw were staff saying, it's like, walk, it's like working in a war zone or a pre-Florence Nightingale hospital, you know, in the First World War. That's how bad it was. And these care staff were putting their lives on the line. So I'd urge everyone to read the COVID reports, the last one of which we published yesterday, which gives our solution to how visits could have always taken place in care homes. So the emotional needs could have been met as well. I think an awful lot of it, people were denied hospital treatment. Care staff were told across this country that there was an unofficial policy that people could not go to hospital from care homes. What does that say about this country and its attitude to age? If somebody said tomorrow, people between 30 and 40 will not be given any medical treatment if they get COVID, there would be outrage across the board. But what we've done as a country, take all the data and everything aside, look at the facts, we have taken a section of society and we have treated, we've taken away their human rights and we've treated their deaths as some kind of hiccup in history. And to be honest, it, these were human rights abuses. They were foreseeable and they are unforgivable. And I believe that people should be held to account. And Eileen, let me just, you, you focus a little bit there on, on the staff and the people who broke the rules. Um, what, um, if you think of the different reasons that people have come to you, what, what have been the majority of whistleblowing complaints? Uh, whistleblowing concerns. First of all, in the early stages, it was um, obviously the lack of PPE. Very quickly, it turned, we started seeing themes that people were being drugged who had dementia to keep them in their rooms because obviously people wandering in and out of patients' rooms with COVID, you could see how it was spreading. So they drugged people. And the government also had a policy where it, it sort of said it was okay to use other people's drugs during COVID. There was an emergency medication um, system in place, which meant there was, there's already wide loopholes for the misuse of antipsychotics. What happened during COVID was that people were given drugs that they had no need of and the impact on their quality of life and on their health, because there's, there's high risks connected to these drugs. And if there's no benefit to the person and the only reason they're being given is to cope in a care home with the government policy and trying to keep people isolated, they drugged people and they drugged thousands of people and kept them in their rooms. And I mean, it's beyond, Belief. So that was the second thing that started to come in. The third thing was staff raising concerns were very quickly, they quickly became the problem. Their lives were made a misery. Um, they weren't spoken to. They weren't um, given their normal shifts. Um, some staff were outrightly sacked. Um, I can't go into detail um, because I can't identify anybody, but staff who um, wanted to isolate because they felt unwell, were told if they did so, they'd be sacked. Um, staff raising concerns about patients coming in from hospital with COVID, they were very quickly um, sent to Coventry and, and treated you know, detrimentally in everything, in every part of their job. We had staff that were crying their eyes out because they didn't know how to look the other way and, and they couldn't cope with it. So um, those were the 
early things and then as it went on people um, were looking after people that needed fluids and they couldn't swallow and it was a massive thing and I think the death toll is much much higher because a lot of people were being diagnosed um, cause of death as dehydration but it was COVID but and they couldn't have a drip. Just jumping on it because I think that you know these we have these scandals winter mm. or whatever where we begin to think, all right, maybe you know, along comes the CQC, maybe we're beginning to get a, a view into this sector and, and a better picture of what happened there. Is your impression, sitting where you sit, that, that there's still a tremendous amount that we don't know about what happened? Oh, absolutely. Um, just going back to the CQC, um, care staff raised over 2,600 whistleblowing alerts with the CQC. Um, there were 15 actions in, re in response to those 2,600 concerns being raised with the CQC. So um, you'll see on our website as well that we've obtained data that showed how much was spent on those 15 actions that the CQC took. Um, so you've got thousands of staff. This is not unusual constantly saying to us we keep, we keep telling this cqc we keep ringing the local authority nobody is helping us nobody is listening so really i mean that's why we campaign for edna's law because we know what the answer is and it's so frustrating um not being able to get the government to see that if you give a voice to those on the front line those who are eyewitnesses you are empowering them and, and we, until we have that, nothing will change. Can you just remind us what Edna's Law is? Edna's Law, um, it's written up in my book, There Is No Me in Whistleblower, which redefines the public interest. The current law, um, I was the first whistleblower to use the current law. It failed in the first case, and it's failed in thousands of cases um, since. And, and it's countless people have suffered and died because there was no one there to listen when care staff said, this is wrong. This is wrong. I mean, to me, that is the way forward is Edna's law would make it a criminal offence not to act on valid concerns. And those concerns have to be investigated by the police, because at the end of the day, we've got loads of regulators. We've had no end of change of regulators and commissions and ombudsmen and billions are spent on this. What we need is an effective law that is a deterrent so that people who do not act on concerns go to prison. Okay. And there was also a system there that there's a paper trail to, to cover the burden of proof needed to take these um, cases to court, which currently doesn't happen with the current legislation. Eileen, thank you very much for that. Thanks for your patience as well. I just want to okay. come where we started, which is with, with um, Lydia Hislop. Lydia, yeah, you're still there, I think, aren't you? I wanted to... you. You laid out the sort of regulatory or the sort of um, accountability landscape in the, at the very top of this session. Um, the Secretary of State has a duty to prevent harm. Um, and you asked the question of whether the harm has been avoidable. Um, do you, are you there, Lydia? I can't see you on the screen. I am, yes. Um, just, let's, let's just go back to that. How, how reasonable do you think it is in the circumstances of a pandemic with the Secretary of State, who I quoted at the beginning with this ambition of throwing a protective arm around the whole sector. Um, should we, as tortoise, look at whether he has fulfilled his duty to prevent harm? Um, I think that um, there is an awful lot of information that we don't yet have, and I would echo what Eileen has said about the importance of hearing from those who were the eyes and ears within the system at the time when coronavirus was ravaging in care homes. We know that regulatory standards were not um, complied with, that, that the quality of care slipped. The things that Eileen is talking about, the things reported by care workers, fall way, way below acceptable standards of care. But we have somehow become inured 
to instances of poor quality care. And much of that is because the way in which care workers have been completely disempowered within the system, that there is no respect and regard and structural way in which care workers can have a voice within the system. And this has contributed to the levels of ignorance which we talked about within the Department of Health. So I certainly think that there are areas where the Secretary of State could have exercised his responsibilities in different ways, could have been more upfront and honest about difficulties such as lack of availability of PPE, which is absolutely crucial. They could have put in staff into care homes. We, we learned about the, the lack of staff in care homes, but the staffing needs in care homes went up massively during the coronavirus crisis. Why weren't nurses, retired care workers, shipped into care homes in order to make sure that there was a, the, the possibility for much, much higher ratios of, of staff to um, residents. So there are certainly things that the Secretary of State could have done to uh, prevent harm, but there are also more structural problems. And I think training is absolutely key in this. I would disagree with Ian there. So for example, in our research, we're finding that most care workers had no training at all in how to care for people that had coronavirus, that they didn't have training in how to even use their PPE. They had no training in infection control. The, these things are key contributing factors. So I think there's an awful lot that we still don't know about what happened, but there are things that we know could and should have been done much better, Kerry. All right. Um, Lydia, we are well over time, so I'm going to have to draw a halt to proceedings there. But um, uh, Lydia Hayes, Natasha Curry, Eileen Chubb, Ian Birrell, Tom Redford, I'd like to thank you all very much. It does feel as it always feels as if we've really only just scratched the surface of this. That it is complicated. It is fragmented. It is um, poorly understood. But at the same time, it's impossible to come away from a conversation like this without thinking that the, the prejudices that we, all of us, including government and policymakers, bring to the system and the people in it seems to play more profoundly in this area than almost any other area of public life that I can think of. So, so there's a, you know, there's a sort of a slightly shaming feeling of, ha of having a, a mirror held up to, to all of us as, as, as part of this conversation. Um, that brings us to the end of day one of the Tortoise COVID inquiry. Day two is next Friday from 10 till 4, so I really hope very much that you will join us for that. Um, but from me and from everybody else here at Tortoise, um, thank you all so much for all the wisdom and the experience and the expertise you brought to this today. And we look forward to seeing you again next week.